Welcome to the revised edition of North Penn Legal Services Custody and Visitation Video Workshop. The purpose of the video is to provide basic information about how a child custody dispute may be handled by the courts or through negotiation or mediation. In the next 30 minutes or so, we will define some of the key terms such as legal custody and physical custody. We will also examine some of the factors parents must consider in deciding whether or not to file a custody lawsuit. We will then look at several common situations involving child custody. Finally, we will describe what happens once a lawsuit is filed. Where do you file the papers? When is the hearing? What happens at the hearing? Who makes the decision? Of course, no two custody cases are exactly alike and the law can change. There's no certain way to predict how your case might be handled. The video is meant to provide basic information which should not be taken as legal advice. We sincerely hope that you and the other persons involved in a child custody dispute are able to reach a fair resolution which is in the best interests of the child whether by negotiation, mediation, or a court trial. Many people believe they know a little bit about custody law and they are quite willing to offer you their opinions. Perhaps your neighbor or cousin has told you that the judge always gives custody to the mother, or fathers always win. Or maybe you were told that a 12-year-old gets to choose where to live. These are examples of street law, which is usually wrong. Every case is different, and what happened to Cousin Jane or your friend Bill might not happen to your case. Let's look at some of the key terms used in custody law. Best interests of the child. This is what judges must determine in making a custody ruling. It represents all the factors a judge must consider when making a decision, including the circumstances and environment of each parent's household, the child's preference, work schedules, and many others. Legal custody. This is the right to be informed about and participate in major decisions affecting the child's physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Most custody orders provide for shared legal custody so that both parents are involved in these major issues. Physical custody. This means the right to have the child without any restrictions or supervision. It can be sole or shared. Sole custody. This means no one else can have the child. Primary custody. This is the right to have the child most of the time. Partial custody. This is the right to have the child some of the time, what most people call visitation. Supervised visitation. This is when a person does not have the right to have the child unless visits are supervised. It is very important to keep these terms in mind as you watch the video, prepare for your hearing, or attempt to carry out the specific terms of an order or agreement. They should also be helpful to you if you and the other party decide to try mediation or to work out your own agreement. Sometimes when parents break up, separate, or divorce, they are able to make their own custody and visitation plans or schedules. They take into account each other's wishes, interests, work schedules, and lifestyles as well as the needs and wishes of the children. They may be able to do this on their own, or they may talk to friends, relatives, religious leaders, counselors, or lawyers in creating a workable plan. Sometimes people agree to submit their problem to a mediator who will set ground rules for discussion and assist them in understanding each person's point of view and coming to a fair agreement. In addition to this video, North Penn Legal Services has produced a separate video on the mediation process. If you think mediation might be helpful, please see the details at the end of this video. If you and the other parent of your child think you can create your own workable plan and do not need a court order, you and the child are indeed fortunate. Good morning. 
Hello, Mrs. Smith. My name is Ann Targonski. Have a seat. Thank you. Thanks for seeing me today. You're welcome. I understand that you're here. You want to discuss a custody lawsuit? Yes. My husband and I have been separated for seven months. We were arguing all the time, and the kids and I finally moved to my parents' house, and he stayed in New Jersey. Were you and your husband able to work out a custody schedule? Well, we tried, and for a while it worked, but we argued about it a lot. The kids are in a lot of activities, and sometimes they just didn't want to go to New Jersey for the weekend. Have you agreed on a set schedule? We can't. His work keeps changing. Sometimes he wants the kids when I have things scheduled, and then he won't come when he says. Are things getting worse? Much worse. He started threatening to keep the kids, and he found out I was seeing someone, and he's always wanting to bring that up. He's beginning to scare me. If things break down at this point in time, you may need to file a custody lawsuit, something that will tell you both what you can and can't do. A court order will set forth a specific schedule for you to follow. Only you can decide if the current custody arrangements involving your child are tolerable. Here are a number of questions to help you decide. Has the other parent threatened to snatch the child and disappear or kept the child from you? Refuse to permit reasonable visitation or refuse to return the child after a visit. Made unreasonable visitation demands or placed unreasonable restrictions on your visits. Refuse to answer reasonable questions about his or her care of the child or provide information about the child's health, education, or other activities. Refuse to provide a current address and phone number. Physically, sexually, or emotionally abuse the child. Put the child in an unsafe or unhealthy environment. Fail to provide minimal adequate supervision and care. Refuse to discuss a workable custody plan. Refuse to cooperate for the child's sake. If you can truthfully say that you and the child's needs are not being met, then a custody or visitation lawsuit may be your best remedy. In Pennsylvania, all custody lawsuits must be filed in the county courts, which are called the Courts of Common Pleas. Generally, the lawsuit must be filed in the state and county where the child has lived for the last six months or where an existing custody lawsuit was filed, even if that is in another state. There are exceptions to this rule. Mrs. Smith, exactly when did you leave New Jersey? It will be eight months and a week. And have you lived with your parents in this county ever since? No, I, I found a place a couple blocks away after I had been there about a month. Are you sure neither you or your husband have filed for custody either in this county or in New Jersey? No, we've never been separated. We were married for ten years. Well, how long did you live in New Jersey? It was eight years. All three of our kids were born there. Well, I believe that you can file for custody here. You and the children have lived in this county, in the Commonwealth, for at least six months. If you are unable to hire an attorney to file a custody lawsuit, you can do it on your own. Many county courts have forms available for you to file pro se or on your own. Watching this video should be a helpful first step because before you file, you need to know where to file and if you should file. All the forms and instructions you will need are in the packet you obtain at the courthouse. If you cannot afford to pay filing fees, you should ask for a set of forms to request the court to let you file without payment of costs or informa pauperis. Hello, my name is Michael Seward and I'm a domestic relations hearing officer in Northumberland County. In our county there are two full-time hearing officers 
who handle nothing but family law proceedings. We are attorneys who have practiced law for several years before being appointed by the president and judge to handle custody cases and other family court matters. Our purpose is to help the court manage the family court caseload more efficiently. In our family court system, there are two levels of custody litigation. The first level is a hearing in front of a hearing officer like myself. The second level is a custody trial in front of a judge of the Court of Common Pleas. The vast majority of our custody cases are resolved at the first level, making the second level unnecessary. Hopefully, after the first level, people don't need to proceed further, but in the event they need to, they can. There are two purposes for our first level of family court. The first is to give the parties an opportunity to reach a formal settlement. It may be that the parties have never been able to sit down and discuss their custody issues and come to an agreement about an arrangement that works for everybody. The custody hearing allows that to happen in a safe environment with somebody like myself who handles custody disputes on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes it just helps to have somebody in the room who can talk about the things that a lot of families have trouble with and that need to be written down on paper. If the parties reach an agreement, the hearing officer can put it down on paper for them in the form of a stipulated custody order. And then that could be enforceable as an order of court, even though it only includes the terms that both parties agree upon. The second purpose of our first level of family court is to expedite the process to allow parties to get into court earlier. In the event that there's a custody dispute and the parties really need the court to make a decision rather than them coming to an agreement, the hearing officer can do this in a quick and efficient manner. Because they handle practically every type of legal case, our judges' time is limited. Judges here in the coming year will set aside only one day per month for custody trials. As a hearing officer, on the other hand, I will be holding custody hearings three days every week. As a matter of scheduling, it's simply faster and more efficient to dispose of custody cases using a hearing officer and as a parent in a custody dispute, you should not have to wait three months for a custody case to be resolved. Our system lets people come to court sooner than they would if we only had custody hearings in front of judges. So what happens to bring parties to a custody hearing? First, every custody hearing is the result of someone filing a complaint for custody or a petition to modify custody. A complaint for custody is the document filed in court to start a new custody case. A petition to modify custody is a form that you would file if you wanted to ask the court to change a custody order that's already in existence. The person who files the document has the obligation to pay the filing fee and to send a copy of the papers to the other side. One of the important things about a court proceeding is that everybody has the opportunity to present their side of the story. So if you ask that a custody hearing be scheduled, it's important that you send a copy of the hearing notice to the other side so they have an opportunity to come at the time and the day the hearing is scheduled. That's why it's the filing party's obligation. So what happens at a custody hearing? First, the parties should arrive early and check in with a member of the court staff. In the event someone fails to appear, the hearing can go on without them. What happens at that point is the hearing officer doesn't consider anything that the missing party would have said. That's probably not in the child's best interest because the more information the hearing officer has, the better, especially if there's a dispute. Everyone will have the opportunity to speak, but only one at a time and only in order. It's important to realize that even though sometimes we call court argument court, arguments are not appropriate in family court. Each side will be given the opportunity to say everything they need to say, and it will have to be done decently and in order. The hearing officer will let everyone know when it's their turn, so it's important to listen. After all, it's very important to be able to respond to what others say, as well as to present your own story. One of the questions that people often ask at our office is, do I need an attorney for a custody hearing? The simple answer is no. You're not required to have an attorney. In fact, you're probably watching this video because you've decided not to have an attorney. However, if you want to, you can, and it might help you. People have many questions about custody law, how custody proceedings will happen, 
and what information is most important to present to the court. A professional can help you by explaining some of these things. But, as I said before, you're not required to have an attorney. Oftentimes, a father and a mother come to custody court, they're able to present their sides effectively, and the hearing officer can make a decision that will satisfy both. But, if you wanted to settle a case before you came to court, one of the advantages an attorney would provide would be to be able to write up your stipulation, and if you had an attorney do that, you may not have to come to court at all, but yet still get the benefit of having a custody order that's based on an agreement you reached and sat down with your attorney and wrote up. What should you say at a custody hearing? Well, say what you want to see happen to your child. You should have a plan in mind that you can express with detail. You should be able to say what days and times that the child should be with one party or the other. If you don't come to an agreement about custody issues, the hearing officer will be making the decision for you. And it's important to give the hearing officer the information that will let them make the right decision that works out with your family. If you have special plans on a certain day of the week, or if your work schedule requires that you pick up your child at a certain time, it's important to let the hearing officer know those things. Otherwise, your order may not fit with your schedule. It's a good idea to write notes down. Don't be afraid to write down what you want to say. When you come to court, you can look at your notes and refer to them so you don't forget anything. This is too important to leave things to forget. Don't try to memorize what you want to say. The worst approach to take at a custody hearing would be to simply berate the other party or say negative things for the purpose of making them look bad. You need to give the hearing officer a positive reason to accept your position, not just try to say the other party is wrong and go ahead thinking that that's enough for the hearing officer to give your request serious consideration. You need to be willing to compromise, and above all, you need to think of your child's well-being. I hear children say sometimes when I interview them that they feel like they're in the middle and they feel like they're being torn apart. One of the stories that I tell them is this. They should imagine a treasure chest full of gold coins, and they should imagine mom on one side of that chest and dad on the other side of the chest, with both of them digging out coins and taking them for themselves as fast as they can. Each side wants to get as many coins as they can for themselves because they want them so bad. Well, what happens to the coins? They get all torn apart and scattered. Hopefully, uh, mom gets what she wants and dad gets what he wants, but you can think about how the coins feel. The child feels that way. So I say to the child, it's like you're that treasure. It's not that you've done something wrong or that you've done something bad that you feel this way. Your parents aren't trying to tear you in two different directions because of anything wrong. It's because, like they both want the coins, they both want to spend time with you. Mom wants to get as much time as she can. Dad wants to get as much time as he can. And if there's some tearing and scattering in the process, it happens to the child. But it's because the child is treasured. Sometimes um, people will come to a custody hearing with the attitude that they need to fight. In family court, that's not the right thing to do. I was asked by a client more than once when I was practicing as an attorney, Mr. Seward, will you fight for me? My answer to that question is, I'm not a professional wrestler. I'm an attorney. I don't fight. I work because there's a job to get done. When you come to family court, there's a job to get done, and fighting only gets people hurt. The person who gets hurt the most is the child in the middle because as you might have heard, as I've heard, the biggest stress on a child in a custody dispute is not going to court or visiting one parent or the other on specific days. It's seeing the battle going on between the parents. That stress on the child is worse than anything else that happens in a custody action. So after all that's done, what happens after a custody hearing? Well, first, uh, the parties could come to an agreement and then never have to come back to court again. That would be best. The second option, the more often happens, is that the hearing officer enters a recommended order. That would be a custody order that the parties would have to follow. If one party failed to follow it, they could be subject to sanctions for contempt of court. 
If one or both parties disagree with the hearing officer's recommended order, they have the opportunity to take exception to it. In the event that they take exception to it, the process for doing that is to file those exceptions with the prothonotary in the courthouse. At that point, a new hearing would be scheduled. At that new hearing, it would be a custody trial in front of a judge. That would be scheduled a month or later down the road, and both parties would have the opportunity to say anything at that custody trial that they could have said at the hearing. It's a fresh start. The judge doesn't look at what happened at the hearing. The judge holds an entirely new hearing. After that, the judge would enter a custody order. It may look like the hearing officer's order. It may look completely different. It depends on what the judge decides would be appropriate at that time. Between those two times, the hearing officer's hearing and the judge's custody trial, in most circumstances, the hearing officer's recommendation is adopted by the judge as an interim order for that time being until after the custody trial. So there's never a time once you get to court that you should be without a custody order if that's what you're asking for. It may not be what you expected, and it may not be satisfactory to you. But remember, any time you don't make an agreement and have a hearing officer or a judge make a decision for you, that's a possible outcome. So that's how custody hearings are handled in Northumberland County. I hope that you feel comfortable with the process now and that you feel rest assured that custody court is here if you need it. Hello, I'm Judge Louise Knight. I'm the judge presiding here in Union County. I, along with President Judge Harold F. Wolfel Jr., decide all the custody cases filed within Snyder and Union Counties. This video is designed to help you better understand what's involved in a custody dispute and understand how a court decides a custody case. There are many reasons why you should try very hard to avoid what is called a custody battle and try to reach an agreement with the other parent on matters of custody. First of all, a custody case is a very emotionally damaging proceeding. It's damaging emotionally to children and to you as the parent. Whenever I talk to children involved in a custody case, as I'm required by law to do, the children almost always tell me that they wish that their parents wouldn't fight about their custody. A child always loves both parents and hates more than anything being part of a custody battle. A child who goes through a custody case is often very much hurt by the process and you as a parent will be very much injured as well. It is a very difficult emotional experience and I can't think of anything that is more difficult in the way of a court type of case. The second reason that it pays to resolve a custody dispute by agreement instead of going to court is that when you come to court with your custody case, you give up control over the outcome. It will be the judge who decides what the custody arrangements will be. This is a very risky situation for you because it means that you no longer have any input into what the outcome or decision will be. In addition, a, a judge has the power to impose all kinds of conditions with respect to custody, some of which you may not find acceptable at all. For example, I can require that a person or parents not consume alcohol while they have custody of their children. I can require parents to attend parenting classes, anger management classes, counseling programs. I can prohibit a parent from having contact with certain persons in the presence of a child. Uh, for example, I can prohibit a boyfriend or a girlfriend from being around the child. I can require that visits or periods of custody be supervised, that they occur only in certain locations. And there are many other restrictions that I can impose, some of which may not be acceptable to you. I'm going to base my custody decision on what I see to be the best interest of the child. I cannot know your child better than you do, and if a parent really searches his or her heart about what's best for the child, you, as the parent and the other parent, really know much better than I what the right decision is. A third reason 
to try and work out custody before you come to court is that a custody battle is extremely complicated and very expensive. The law says that you can represent yourself. You're not required to have an attorney, but you could be at a significant disadvantage as a result because the law also says that there are no special rules for persons who represent themselves. An individual appearing on his or her own behalf in a custody case is bound by the same rules of procedure, the same rules of evidence that apply to an attorney. And I, as the judge, must be impartial. I cannot help you present your case if you don't have an attorney. If you have an attorney, then you must be prepared to expend significant amounts of money. And even if you represent yourself, you're going to doubtless be involved in paying for a custody evaluation by a custody expert, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, who will be required to evaluate you, the other parent, your child, significant others, and all other factors that have a bearing on custody. You can expect that the custody expert alone is probably going to cost somewhere between two and three thousand dollars and you'll be required to share that expense with the other parent. If you add the attorney's fees onto the cost of the custody expert, a typical custody case can cost anywhere from $5,000 or more. A fourth reason to work out custody instead of coming to court is that a custody decision is really never final until a child turns 18. You can go through all the expense and all the emotional wrangling of a custody dispute and only have it last for a few months because your life might, may change, your child's life may change, and it may be necessary to come back to court. There are procedures for filing to modify, filing a petition to modify a custody decision, but it may involve starting the hearing proceedings all over again. And so all of the effort and time that you expended and all of the expense may be for nothing. So if you do end up in court, one of the questions you may have is, well, what are the things that guide a judge in making a custody decision? Let me outline some of those factors for you. The law says that if both parents are fit, they both have a right to be involved in raising their children. A court will not severely limit another parent's rights of custody except under the most extreme of circumstances. Speaking for myself, I believe very strongly that both parents must have generous amounts of time with their children, and I see no parent as being preferred unless there are specific reasons that a parent should be limited in his or her custody rights. A child has the right to know both parents, and many parents unfortunately confuse their own best interests and needs with those of their children. My decision on custody is going to be based on what I see to be the best interest of the children, not of the parents. A second misconception or legal principle that will guide me is that no preference is given to a parent simply because of his or her sex. A mother isn't preferred, a father isn't preferred. Both mothers and fathers stand on equal footing before the court. A third factor to keep in mind is that I will give serious consideration to a child's preference for custody, provided the child is old enough to have a solid factual basis for that preference. There's a myth circulating around that I hear all the time from parents is that when the child reaches a certain age, 13 or 14, that he or she is then entitled to determine custody. That's not the law. Until a child is 18, until he or she is an adult, it is the court that decides the custody and the child's preference does not control. It's a factor, but it is not the controlling factor. In addition, the, there is a legal principle that children, siblings, should be kept together under the same roof. That is to say, a court has to have very strong reasons to split up custody of children and award primary custody of one child to one parent and primary custody of another child to another parent. So you can expect that whatever custody decision is made, the children are going to be kept together. The court will also give very, very serious consideration to which parent is more likely to foster access for the children to the other parent. If I perceive that a particular parent is interfering with custody of the other parent, 
is being difficult, uncooperative, is criticizing the other parent in front of the child and doing everything in his or her power to drive a wedge between the child and the other parent, that's going to be a factor that may well result in the other parent, the parent who's being more cooperative and more generous, being the one to have primary custody. That's a very important factor. Another principle that is of importance to a court is that a parent's right to custody is not connected to a parent's duty to pay child support. I know many of you out there watching this video have problems, perhaps, with collecting child support, or you have a parent who is not paying child support in a timely way. The law says that the right of support, the duty to pay support, is independent of a right of custody. Children have the right to know both parents regardless of what the support arrangements are. Children have nothing to do with support. That's between the parents. Custody is everything about the child's rights. Now, as I said in the beginning, you're always better off trying to resolve custody disputes without going to court, even if you can only resolve a piece of your custody dispute. Let's say you're able to work out the schedule for the weekend or week, regular weekday custody, but you're having difficulty in figuring out what to do on the holidays. You can bring the narrow issue of the holiday custody to court and present the court with your agreement on the other aspects of custody. That's perfectly acceptable and it's preferable. The more you can work out about custody, the better. And even if you are at a point where you are having difficulty resolving your custody uh, arrangements, but you think that there is a basis on which you might do it if you had some help, there is help short of bringing your case to court. We can provide you with opportunities for what we call mediation. Speaking for Snyder and Union Counties, Judge Wolfel and I have often referred cases to mediation by a family certified, certified family mediator. This is a person who is a psychologist and is specially certified in helping parents, facilitating uh, parents uh, in reaching an agreement on custody. All the time I refer parents to custody mediation. Uh, usually in about three sessions of about an hour each, the mediator can either determine whether the parents are going to be able to work out in a custody arrangement or not. And after those up to three sessions, the case will come back over to me. Nothing is lost. It can go forward at that point as a regular custody case. But mediation is very inexpensive compared to a full-blown custody battle. All the mediation sessions are absolutely confidential. No one ever knows what goes on. The only thing that I ever hear about the results of mediation is whether it's been successful or not. If the mediator tells me the mediation is successful, there is usually a, an informal agreement produced as a result of the mediation. It's passed on to the attorneys if the parties have attorneys. If they don't, uh, it is then uh, uh, converted by me into a final agreement of custody. If the mediation is unsuccessful, I'm told that, and the custody case picks up right where it left off. If you cannot work out your custody on your own, of course, the courts are always available to help you, and we will decide the custody case, and we will do it in accordance with what's in the best interest of your children. That is always the driving force in custody decisions, the driving principle. What is best for the children? And if there is anything that is more difficult for a court to decide than a custody case, I don't know what it is. Custody cases are difficult for everyone. Uh, I encourage you to work out your custody cases, but if you can't, the court is here to help you. We sincerely hope that this custody video will help you decide to do what is best for you and your children. Of course, the information contained in this video must be quite general in nature and must not be considered to be legal advice. Every case is different, and we cannot predict how your case will turn out.